Um, thank you. So this is like a joint project with Johan Mankert and with Romanos Briefties, who are at the audience, and uh, it's called the Long and Short of Financing Government Spending. Uh, I should say that uh, what I will be talking about today doesn't necessarily express the views of the ECB, the Deutsche Bundesbank, or the National Bank of Belgium, okay? So let me just uh, tell you what this project is about. We are asking the following question. Does it matter how the U.S. government finances its spending shocks, in particular thinking about the fiscal multiplier, and also in particular thinking about sort of the maturity financing of spending shocks, whether I finance, uh, whether the Treasury finances with short-term debt or with long-term debt. Does, does that make a, have, a, have some implication about the fiscal multiplier? And the answer that we provide in this paper is that yes, it does. In fact, when the Treasury has financed its uh, spending shocks short-term, this led to a larger fiscal multiplier. I'll try to convince you uh, about this by showing you some evidence from uh, VAR exercises. We have a lot of them in the paper. I'm not going to be able to summarize everything. Uh, what happens is that when you find a short term, consumption is crowded in, strongly crowded in, <clears throat> following a spending shock. Well, this is not the case with long term financing of a spending shock. Number two, I will try to explore a theory that can rationalize this fact. This is going to be a simplistic model, uh, boring from a real related finance literature. Um, I will explain this later. And then uh, number three, I will explore the policy implications of theory and evidence, thinking about you know, policy going forward, how does a, an optimizing government want to uh, do its portfolio choice when um, it's between long and short-term debt, when short-term debt uh, increases, issuing short-term debt increases the fiscal multiplier, whereas long-term debt has other uh, good stuff going on. It provides insurance against uh, fluctuations in bond prices and things like that. And I, I will, uh, if we manage to reach that part of the talk, I will be more explicit about this. So in the empirics, uh, we do a bunch of VAR exercises, and these are based on two, uh, two papers that have uh, done kind of similar exercises, but in the context of um, uh, the fiscal multiplier, is it larger when uh, debt is bought by foreign investors or when it's bought by domestic investors? And this is uh, a paper by Romanos uh, and his co-author and also another paper by Fernando and his co-authors, okay? So I'm gonna be using sort of like the techniques that these guys have employed to look at the source of financing, but here apply to our question looking at the maturity financing, uh, long versus short, not uh, inter uh, foreign versus external uh, investors, okay? But then sort of like the empirical strategy is kind of like similar, and I'll tell you about this more. Uh, mostly I will be focusing on the proxy uh, VAR, which is basically what Romanos did in his paper. Uh, probably, I mean, we treat this as a baseline. Uh, it comes first in the paper. It doesn't have to be uh, uh, thought of as a best baseline, but, you know, I'm not going to have time today to talk about uh, local projections, which is what uh, Fernando has been using in his paper. Uh, I will show you that the fiscal multiplier is, uh, is larger when the U.S. government has financed that short term, and that this is accounted for mostly by consumption. So at least in terms of the consumption seems to be the robust uh, margin. Uh, in some of the exercises, we find some responsiveness of investment to the maturity financing and others not, no? Um, then the theory is going to be a, a deliberately simple model. So if you think of a, a standard New Keynesian model uh, where households are using long and short bonds just to substitute consumption there temporarily, uh, then sort of like the maturity finances of a spending shock is not going to matter. It's not going to make any difference. Okay, so uh, all that matters in such a model is the path of government spending um, and, and not the sort of like uh, the maturity of the debt that you're issuing. So in order to make that matter, you have to turn to, towards theories uh, which uh, uh, tell us, and that's a recent literature in finance, telling us that bond supply is, is relevant. Uh, and there is works by Dimitri Vajanos and his co-authors, Chris Namurthy and Vissing Jorgensen and many others. So we borrow essentially like, from this theory. In particular, we focus on this paper, which is like by Greenwood, Hansen, and Stein. Uh, what these guys did is that they showed that short bonds, they provide liquidity to the private sector. So it's kind of like money-like assets. And we borrowed the idea from their paper. They have a simple model. 
uh, in which uh, short bonds enter to, into utility, capturing basically the idea that they provide money-like services to the private sector. We have a more elaborate model. So we build a, a diamond dig big model, which is based on, oops, uh, which is based on uh, Hagedorn 2018. Um, and uh, I will tell you more about this. It's, it's a simple model in which um, agents are heterogeneous. They face uh, urgent consumption needs. If they have to liquidate their portfolio, which they choose like before they get hit, but before they know uh, the realization of a shock to, to the marginal utility of consumption, then uh, uh, we make the assumption that they can only liquidate the, the short end of their portfolio. So the short bonds can, provide, can act like money. In fact, we have something like in the model, this is like governed by a sort of like bonds in advance constraint, uh, kind of like a cash in advance constraint. Uh, you'll see uh, some of the equations later, uh, and therefore uh, are enable agents to, to finance a higher consumption stream. And as such, uh, indeed this model, it's gonna predict a larger multiplier, we calibrate it to the US data, we explore it, uh, and so on and so forth, and show that uh, this is a good laboratory to think about this, and in particular to think about uh, optimal policy uh, going forward. Uh, so here's like the last bit of the paper. Uh, we uh, asked the question, how would an optimizing government that uh, can issue either long-term debt or short-term debt uh, dis uh, choose its op optimal debt management strategy? And there's a literature on optimal debt management uh, starting from the work of Angelettos and Guerra Nicolini and then Lustig, Sleet, and Yeltekin. And these are uh, sort of like uh, mod canonical models, either New Keynesian models or neoclassical models without uh, pricing frictions. Uh, and necessarily, what, what this literature has produced is uh, governments ought to focus on issuing long-term debt. And why is that the case? Well, because long bond prices could vary negatively with government deficits. So when you get hit by a spending shock, then long bond prices drop, and that makes the market value of your debt drop. In other words, long-term debt like provides as it's, as it's called in the literature, fiscal hedging, fiscal insurance against spending shocks. Uh, the, a recent strand of this literature, uh, which includes some of my work as well, but also the Bortoli, Nunes and Yared, uh, Bandari, Golosov, er, uh, Evans and Sargent and others, <coughs> I was trying to look for reasons for uh, why sh uh, short-term debt may be attractive to debt managers, uh, given that they are interested in smoothing taxes across time. Okay, and uh, the, these papers have like different stories. We add to this line of work by finding another good attribute of short-term debt, namely that it increases the fiscal multiplier. And that, and that also is a hedge against the spending shock because if the fiscal multiplier is larger and you have distortion in taxes, uh, output is, uh, has a stronger sort of like um, uh, impact effect or you know, a more long-lasting effect following a spending shock and that in, sort of like increases your revenue and you don't have to resort to an, uh, a big increase in distortionary taxation um, in order to finance uh, your integral budget. So we do this kind of exercise. We solve an optimal policy model within this framework. At the end, we find that the, our calibrated model gives enough reason for a government to uh, like to issue short-term debt, and if I manage, I will show you some of the simulations uh, from that paper, but probably I will uh, not be able to summarize like the details of uh, the policy program. Uh, let's look at the empirics. So we'd like to estimate uh, this, uh, this system of equations, so why you could, it uh, has consumption, investment, output, and government spending. And we're interested in identifying uh, one of these structural shocks, uh, namely the government spending shock, right? And the system can be equivalently written like that when we invert matrix A. What we'd like to do then is S, uh, have uh, identify the columns of uh, matrix B, which are, enable us to identify the government spending shock, the structural government spending shock. We don't have enough restrictions. It's a well-known problem. There's different ways of, of resolving this problem. We use covariance restrictions to identify B. Basically, uh, consider a, a, an instrument, which is like the defense news uh, series by uh, Rami and Zubairi. Uh, sorry. Um, uh, then these defense news are co covary with the, uh, the structural government spending shock and they're orthogonal to all, all other structural shocks. Now, on top of this, in order to identify short-term financing versus long-term financing, 
we basically consider uh, short-term finance shock as one that occurs in periods where the ratio of uh, short-term debt over long-term debt in the, in the United States has increased, okay? Uh, and uh, conversely, a long-term finance shock is one that has occurred in a, in a SAP sample where the, the, um, the, short, the short over long ratio has decreased. Okay, that's our, our, one of our identifications then. We also look, uh, use local projections, which has, amounts to a different uh, kind of uh, identification. Um, so here's the responses to spend to a 1% increase in government spending, uh, and that's output. This is consumption and this is investment. As you can see, output, the blue line represents like a short-term finance shock, and then the red line represents a long-term finance shock. As you can see, there's a, a substantial difference like between the two. And it's basically, at least in this specification, it's all driven by consumption, okay? So uh, the bottom uh, graphs here show like the difference in terms of these estimates. And, you know, these differences are across short-term and long-term financing are statistically significant for output and consumption. There's not a statistically significant difference for investment. So it's like a consumption, which is something that's coming up in every estimation of the model that we have. It's a, the robust in the margin. There's a, a big difference. This, this can be stated in terms of cumulative multipliers. Uh, here's the, uh, the graph for output, consumption, and investment. Uh, you can see there's a substantial difference. Accumulated multipliers uh, defined in a standard fa fashion, I'm not going to go through the details, are, uh, exceed one and they persistently throughout the horizon greater than one under short-term financing. Uh, and under long-term financing, they might be at the a sort of like short horizon. The impact effect might actually be uh, comparable, uh, but then very, very rapidly they decay uh, be, and become insignificant. Okay, so this is also in terms of the uh, fiscal mul cumulative multipliers. Now, this exercise may suffer from many sort of like biases. So it's worthwhile like considering, and in the paper we do a lot of robustness, so, which I'm not going to be able to show you here. But you know, let me let me basically uh, address or what sort of biases one might uh, anticipate to have. Like for example, there could be some endogeneity in the treasurer's decision to issue uh, short or long-term debt. So for example, you issue short when the yield curve is upward sloping because short is cheaper. Then you issue long when the yield curve is downward sloping. But a downward sloping yield curve is also one that's uh, correlated or predicts, let's say, a recession, you know? And it could be that uh, what we're, our estimates are capturing is uh, um, an upcoming recession when you find it's long term. Of course, you can invert the argument. The fiscal multiplier could be, according to some folks, larger during a recession. Then it could also be that long-term financing is actually more in high debt periods. Uh, this is a characteristic of US debt management. Issue more of long-term debt, which is considered uh, safer by, by the treasure, treasury uh, during a, when the debt to GDP ratio increases. So, you know, maybe the debt to GDP ratio affects sort of like the, uh, the economy because there is some politically, political controversy about how to manage uh, or finance debt or maybe distortionary tax are more likely to rise and the like. So we, we split the sample in high debt versus low uh, debt subsamples. And we run the same sort of like exercise. We find qualitatively no difference in terms of uh, our estimates, uh, similar to what I showed you before. It could be that shocks are different, um, of different rate nature. It's unlikely because we identify them with defense news. If you look at the impulse responses, uh, we actually get uh, uh, very similar responses for short-term versus long-term finance uh, shocks. Uh, you know, in order to treat this, we, we throw in the VAR wages, uh, taxes, uh, law, uh, interest rates, like, you know, this kind of things which we think are, could be capturing, could be controlling for a uh, difference in the nature of the shocks. Still, the, you know, nothing's changing. Uh, the monetary policy response could be different. Uh, different. Of course, we add the short-term interest rate in, uh, in our VAR. Uh, again, uh, we also split the sample in post-1980s, pre-1980s, because arguably monetary policy was different in terms of fighting inflation. Across these two subsamples, we drop observations for the Great Recession and so on. We do all, a bunch of checks, and then our results are, are robust like, to, to all of these. Okay, so you don't have to worry. Here is like a, 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 an indication of this. This is a VAR, the same as the one that I had the, shown you before but it has like wages, it has interest rates, the slope and the level of the yield curve, long and short interest rates, it has uh, the GDP deflator, 
uh, we extend this uh, in unreported experiments in the main paper to be reported in the online appendix of this paper. So uh, again, qualitatively, doesn't change our results. Right, so the theory. So um, what will the model look like? Like I said, you have to turn to a theory which has, in which uh, sort of like the bond quantity will make uh, interest rates change, respond, or interest rates will respond to the bond quantity, which is not a, st a standard neoclassical model. So you have to turn to theories where short bonds provide sort of like convenient services to investors, uh, and they function like money, which is what we do. You can turn to long bond clienteles like uh, Vajanos and Cole Greenwood, Vajanos and other co-authors. Uh, you could do a, a bunch of things, and in the paper we discuss a bunch of the alternatives. We say that we choose one, right, uh, focusing on uh, the sort of like money attributes of short-term debt, and here's how we model it. Uh, it follows very closely uh, Hagedern, 2018, but here uh, there's going to be two assets. So it's going to be short-term and long-term debt, okay? Now, these are the preferences of the, of, uh, of, a, of an A, of the typical agent of the, there's not a representative agent here. There is some heterogeneity, although we don't allow it to, we kill it at the end of every period. We don't allow it to exert a big influence. So we don't think uh, that there is some sort of like interaction um, that it's worth highlighting. But, you know, the agent here has finances consumption, big C and little c. And little c is uh, sub-period two consumption. Uh, before uh, realizing this random variable, which is like a preference shock, theta, the agent has to commit to a bond portfolio and also commit to big C consumption. When this theta is realized, uh, the agent already has like short and long bonds, so they made the portfolio choice uh, uh, before, but then um, they can finance consumption in uh, little c subject to this, um, this constraint. Okay, which is like a bonds in advance constraint. Okay, so uh, the maximum consumption that you can, you can actually finance is equal to the real value of short-term debt that you, uh, that you hold. When you get hit by a high theta shock, you like to liquidate your bond portfolio, but it turns out that what is more liquid is the short-term debt, so you liquidate that and you finance consumption out of that. Okay? Um, and then uh, in terms of what the, these implications for the model, agents will hold short-term debt also for the service of financing this consumption, not only for return properties, for its return properties, they will hold long-term debt to allocate consumption intertemporally. That's a standard macro uh, asset pricing uh, argument there. Um, uh, and that's it. So there, this model also generates a term premium, right? Because uh, short-term debt is valuable to agents uh, along the margin of financing urgent consumption needs. Okay, and this slide basically describes that at the margin, an agent who is constrained uh, will have uh, this level of theta, so denoted by theta tilde. It's an object that plays a role here because uh, it's important to characterize it in, in equilibrium. Okay, so these are two bond pricing equations, one for short-term debt, the first one, and the other one is a standard Euler equation for long-term debt, which in our model is a perpetuity that pays the King coupon. So, uh, equation five is a standard asset pricing formula that's familiar to all, all macroeconomists. What might be less familiar here is this Euler equation, which does not does only feature expected inflation, uh, the uh, expected margin utility of consumption in the next period. It also features this additional term, right, which is like the money-like services that um, that short bonds provide to the private sector. So they will not hold uh, short-term debt for its return properties only but also for the services that it provides. And the rest of the model is standard. There's a, a New Keynesian Phillips curve. There, um, there's a resource constraint. There is a specification for monetary and fiscal policy uh, through ad hoc rules. Uh, it's, uh, it's not worthwhile talking about these objects. What it's worthwhile doing is looking more closely at this first top equation, right, which prices the short-term asset. Right? And you can log linearize this. Um, and here's the formula. So if you also think that this is the short bond price, so it's the inverse of the short-term nominal interest rate, if you think that monetary policy sets the short bond, the nominal interest rate, so that this holds, this, uh, this sum here is equal to zero, which basically amounts to compensating investors for expected inflation only, um, then this term is gonna drop, and then you have like a, fr a, a first order stochastic difference equation for consumption. Now, if you solve this forward, what you get is consumption 
as a function of the short bond supply, okay? Um, in this model, if you assume also that taxes are lump sum, you can actually make the claim that the short bond supply is uh, equivalent to the share of short over long uh, term debt, okay? So it's kind of like an analytical, uh, uh, a simple analytics kind of framework that we're using here. Um, so assume that the short bond supply is related according to uh, this function to the government spending shock, where VARO is the, uh, the coefficient that can be either positive in the case of short-term financing and uh, negative in the case of long-term financing. Uh, total consumption in this economy can also be written as a function of this coefficient of the government spending shock, and then you get like the analytical expression for the fiscal multiplier. And it looks like this, right? So the fiscal multiplier can be one plus like this expression, which is, uh, is capturing the effect of financing short or, or not financing long, uh, not financing short on the constraint that the agents face, but also looking forward because the agents are doing intertemporal substitution, they account for the possibility that these constraints are gonna matter in the future. So they're intertemporal, uh, this matters also for their intertemporal behavior. <laughs> and hence you get like this, you get like this expression, okay? So if you're financing short, this means that this coefficient here is positive. Uh, otherwise, if you're financing long, it's negative, and then the multiplier can be greater than or uh, less than or equal, uh, or less than one, right? So if you're financing short, the multiplier is above one. If you're financing long, the multiplier is below one. The same works uh, when you have a Taylor rule, you can solve also this model analytically. Now next, we calibrate this model. Uh, to the U.S. data. Uh, we assume that the share, as defined, say, in the empirical uh, exercise, the share of short over long is, again, a function of the government spending shock because we're only interested in looking at uh, impulse responses uh, here for this, calibrate, for this linearized version of the model. Um, we assume that monetary policy follows a Taylor rule, and we vary sort of like the parameters of this rule, and fiscal policy follows uh, this fiscal rule, which is also standard in uh, the context of macro models, taxes are linked to lack debt. D uh, denotes the uh, phase value of, of debt. Okay, uh, we set the VARO parameter based on the evidence of our proxy SVAR. Uh, we assume that the, uh, there's a distribution somewhere over there, but I was not very explicit. That distribution is looked normal, so basically we calibrate the distribution so that the model can match the empirical evidence presented in Greenwood, Hansen, and Stein, where these guys look at um, what happens to the short, the, uh, the term premium, uh, let's say, when you increase the, the supply of T-bills, right, over GDP, right? And we do the same exercise over like discipline, the calibration of the model, and basically these are the results you get. Um, so short-term finance, uh, shocks are displayed here with this, with the blue lines, and long-term finance shocks are the red lines. Um, these graphs vary, the, assume that a monetary policy is, follows this very simplistic uh, inflation targeting rule, and we vary this coefficient. So phi p can be 1.5, or it can also be equal to one, um, uh, and both are fit here in the, in the graph. So again, you can see that, um, uh, following a spending shock, output increases more when you finance short term. The Taylor rule, unsurprisingly, the specification of the Taylor rule exerts an influence, and then you know you get crowding. You don't you get less crowding out of consumption in some of the specifications. You can get crowding in um, uh, under long term finance. You get uh, uh, strikingly a lot more cra crowding out, and the fiscal multiplier, which is shown here at the bottom panel, is is less. Uh, next, uh, you know, what ba what's, what's basically going on is that in, the, in this Euler equation for short-term debt, the, the bond supply uh, of short bonds acts as like a demand disturbance, right? So when, when the Treasury finance is short, shot, uh, short, yeah, this demand shock, uh, occur, shock occurs, okay? And it has like a positive sign, and that exerts like a positive influence on, on consumption, so uh, amplifies the spending shock. Now, if you have a Taylor rule, an interest rate rule which is inertial, then can, that can further amplify demand shocks, right? That's a standard thing uh, in, uh, um, 
the context of the Eucasian model. So uh, we look at also this type of monetary, oops, this type of monetary policy uh, where the Taylor rule is, in, the interest rate rule is inertial uh, with a 0.9 coefficient on the lag interest rate and then uh, you know, the phi pi uh, is, can be 1.5 or can be equal to one. And then, you know, once again, you find that the, uh, the short term, financing short term uh, amplifies considerably the shock. And the same thing can also work for the fiscal theory of the price level, um, in fact, right? So when you have a regime where monetary policy is passive uh, and fiscal policy is active, so taxes are constant, uh, and monetary policy essentially monetizes the debt. In this kind of environment, you get a larger fiscal multiplier. Why? Because the shock is not only filtered through the Phillips curve and the Euler equation, it's also filtered through the government budget constraint, and thus you can get like a big difference in terms of the fiscal multiplier. Okay, and the last exercise, so this was in a nutshell sort of like solving the model, calibrating it, and verifying that uh, indeed there is uh, a big uh, difference in terms of the, it's a, a difference in terms of the fiscal multiplier and quantifying sort of like this difference through the lenses of our model. And the last bit of the paper solves an optimal policy pro, uh, program asking what would the government like to do when it faces a choice between financing long uh, or financing short, okay? Um, so with this tertiary taxes, a higher multiplier is gonna translate to lower fiscal deficits at uh, times of high expenditures. Uh, this will enable the government to smooth tax distortions across time. Uh, Short-term yields are lower and therefore issuing short bonds lowers the overall costs of, of servicing this, the debt. However, long bonds are also good in terms of uh, smoothing taxes because they provide, as Angeletto's Buer and Nicolini uh, suggest, fiscal insurance. So, you know, we solved this model. Uh, unfortunately, there's only half a minute left. What is the outcome here? Uh, you, I'm not gonna be able to explain it very deeply. Uh, if you're intrigued, you can read it in the paper. Um, you don't wanna issue long-term debt, basically, which reverses sort of like the, the conclusions drawn from the standard literature. Issuing short-term debt in this kind of model and exploiting the fact that the fiscal multiplier is larger becomes optimal. Thank you.